Welcome to the Chapter 6 podcast on Section 6.8. Today we're going to be dis uh, discussing um, electron configurations for elements. Electron configurations are just basically to describe the organization of electrons within an atom uh, by filling the necessary orbitals. Um, orbitals are always filled in, in order of increasing energy. Uh, we don't put any more than two electrons in any particular orbital, but remember certain um, level sublevel types have different numbers of orbitals associated with them. Um, what we'll end up with is a lot of paired electrons and then maybe a small number of unpaired electrons. And that will correspond to some of the behaviors and arrangements for um, elements uh, and some of the things they have they may have in common. Uh, an orbital diagram it basically is is a physical representation by either boxes or underlines or arrows. Um, so what we have here is an arrow diagram, or and here, you know, carbon has six electrons. We always start if you follow this figure on the on the right here. We always start by filling the the lowest energy level first, which would be one s. So one s gets two electrons because s only has one orbital, so it can only hold two electrons. And we represent this with an up and down arrow. Because we have four electrons left, we have to continue. So we go through here, then we move our way over to the right, and then we go down again. So the next one we, the next level we'll hit is 2s. And because it's an s sub level like 1s, we can put no more than two electrons in there. Again, our up and down arrows. And we still have two electrons left, so we go down, we follow the arrow, then we go back up to the top and over to the right, and 2p comes next. Now P has three orbitals, and even if, even though you're not filling in all of the orbitals, you still have to write out all of the boxes to show that there are three orbitals for the 2p. And then we put in one electron in each of the two orbitals, um, because one of the rules states that we, we're, for orbitals like this, we're only allowed to put in one electron each before we can start doubling up. So because there are only two electrons left, you fill in two here, and the rest remains empty. Um, and we'll talk more about the ramifications of having a partially filled uh, set of orbitals later, but this is what it's supposed to look like. An alternative way of doing this is by using what we call a complete configuration. This is more of a shorthand version. And what happen what, what this is, is um, 1s represents uh, the, uh, the orbital, and then the, the superscripted number represents the number of arrows or number of electrons within that sublevel. So for for carbon we have two in the 1s then two in 2s and then because there are only two electrons left and because 2p is what comes next that's where the 2p goes. So you can think of these superscripted numbers like arrows then representing the number of arrows. This does not mean like squared okay it's just it's just a different way to refer to um, uh, uh, to express a configuration for an element. And we'll be practicing these. Um, again, here's another example. So this relates the quantum numbers to what you see in our orbital diagram. Sometimes you'll see arrow diagrams written like this, but not always. Okay, But these correspond to the M a sub L, M sub S, L, and N. Um, and this is our or again our, our um, configuration, our complete configuration. So this tells us the quantum level, this tells us the type of orbital, and this tells us the number of electrons within the orbital. Remember up arrows represent plus one half spins, spin numbers, and the down arrow represents a negative one half spin number, just something to be aware of. This was just, a, I wanted to show you how um, the arrow diagrams relate to the quantum numbers. They're just different versions of the same thing. Um, so you might be wondering why for certain elements we, we uh, only put in one, or for carbon, we only put in one orbital in each of the, in each of the uh, two of the three P orbitals, but we didn't double them like we did right away with the 1S and the 2S. And the reason why is this, for degenerate orbitals, so we're talking about orbitals that, you know, more specifically P, D, and F's, of, of orbitals where they're basically the same energy what you want to do is you want to put in up arrows okay and the reason why is because um, it's a more stable form for um, the electrons to be in 
and um, you know the parallel spins give it some some sort of stability to be aware of. But for you guys, um, just keep in mind, you know, no, don't double up um, electrons in multi-orbital sublevels until you've put one electron in each of the orbitals for that particular um, uh, set. Notice in the figure on the right that you know for carbon and for nitrogen and, and beryllium where you have parallel spins, you, you can see it, you can see the application of Hun's rule, Hun's rule in the arrow diagrams, but you don't see them in the electron configuration uh, that's the shorthand version because you only see the numbers, you don't see the actual arrows. So there's one of the differences between the way these are expressed. Um, here's an, uh, an electron configuration example. Let's say we had phosphorus, and they ask for how many unpaired electrons does the elect does the atom have. Well, what we have to do first is configure those fir first 15 electrons. We always start with 1s, and the reason why I'm doing the arrow diagram is because I'm looking for unpaired electrons. And um, if you think about it, when I'm looking at these configurations in the shorthand, you don't really get a feel for what's paired and unpaired. So it's best to uh, always um, draw arrows if you're looking for something like that. So we have 15 electrons, the first two go in 1s, the next two go in 2s, the next um, six go in p, so we've done 10, there are five left, Three, uh, 3s gets two electrons and then 3p follows, there are only three electrons left and because of Hun's rule each one of the orbitals gets, uh, gets one electron. And if we're looking for unpaired electrons, we're looking for single electrons. So we can see that there are three unpaired electrons for phosphorus. So these are condensed electron configurations. Sometimes they're called complete configurations. And we also have the noble gas configuration, which is represented here. Sometimes um, it's for us, if we're going to talk about uh, the chemical behavior of some of these elements, it's... Um, it's really inconvenient for us to write out all of these electrons. Sometimes we're only interested in the outermost electrons, which we know as valence electrons. So, for instance, we can represent sodium in one of two ways. We can use the complete configuration or we can use the, the noble gas configuration. So, notice that we have something, we have neon in square brackets. That is what we call the noble gas core. So we use noble gases only in square brackets. And so what we can do is what this tells us is that sodium has an electron configuration like neon and then this extra stuff. Okay, so electrons represented by the symbol, okay, so this is our core. The valence electrons are, are, are what are not in the core. So these are the outermost electrons and for bonding purposes it can really be helpful for us to kind of isolate these in a configuration that looks like this. Okay, now for elements 1 through 30 all outer shell electrons are valence electrons, but for heavier ones, this isn't true. And you think about the overlapping back in one of the earlier points, um, that will make a little bit more sense. And that's something we'll illustrate more in class. Uh, transition metals, these start in period four, and these are transition metals. These always end with D sublevels. Um, and just be aware that there are many transition metals that do not follow uh, normal electron configuration rules. And if you think about it, if, uh, if these transition metals and heavier metals are able to, uh, other don't follow the rules, it kind of explains why a lot of these transition elements and metals below period four have um, different charges. Uh, and the reason why is because they can rearrange themselves in different ways uh, that gives them different forms of stability and as a result, of electron loss and gain and redistribution, they might end up with different charges as a result. And so here are a couple examples. So manganese all the way through and then argon. These are some that do follow the rules, uh, but there are many others that don't. Um, lanthanide and actinide series are where the 4F elements are. Um, these are in period 6 uh, with respect to the lanthanides and period 7 for the, the actinides. And um, these we fill up the 4F and the 5F. We never fill up anything past 5F as far as we're concerned because the periodic table just doesn't account for elements larger than these. And there is a little bit of controversy because they do kind of show up 
where the D sublevel is supposed to be, so where the spaces are, or where the actual inner transition metals are supposed to be inserted. So there's some con controversy in terms of how you configure these, uh, but odds are you're not going to have to configure these because, I mean, those are pretty long. And that's it.